Hello, my name is Tamo Nakahara and thanks for joining our Weave online user group. Uh, this is a weekly series that uh, we've been doing seasonally and this season we're doing it on Tuesdays at 10 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, I run the um, developer experience team here at the company called Weaveworks for the Weave user group. And today's topic is delivering quality at speed with GitOps. Uh, we're very lucky here to have one of our customer success engineers, Brice Fernandez, dialing in from London. I'm here from San Francisco. And uh, we'll be covering this topic today. So hopefully you're here because uh, you've heard of the term GitOps and you're interested, or maybe this is your first time, or maybe you've learned a little bit, but you'd like to learn more. So if that's the case, you are in very good hands with Brice. So before we get started, just a little bit about us. So uh, as I mentioned, we work for a company called Weave Works. It's a startup based in San Francisco, London, Berlin, um, New York, uh, and a distributed teams. Uh, if you've heard of RabbitMQ, our CEO and CTO are the creators of RabbitMQ, the technology and the company. So they built that years ago and then they sold it to the VMware. Uh, and then we were kind of part of VMware for a while. Uh, and then they started seeing needs in the container space and so started building out open source projects and product plans around uh, what would eventually um, get built into this new company called Weaveworks. Uh, we're a startup with um, Excel partners, Google Ventures, and other funding, uh, but we're particularly in the Kubernetes space, so it kind of makes sense to see how we are in the Google Venture space. Uh, a little bit of our background, um, we're definitely founded on open source, like I mentioned. Um, our first project uh, was called WeaveNet, which is still around and widely used. It is really one of the premier um, projects out there that you can use um, if you want to network your Kubernetes clusters. Uh, since then, we built out a few other things and more that aren't on this list. Um, but core parts of that uh, were uh, Cortex, which if you've heard of Prometheus, um, it's an open source um, monitoring solution that then Cortex built upon that and improved upon to make it scalable. Uh, we also have Flux, uh, which has just joined the CNCF Sandbox, so there'll be a talk actually in the coming weeks on that. Uh, that does automated deployments. Uh, and then Weave Scope is an observability uh, project uh, that you can use to uh, see the state of your cluster in real time in different views. Uh, and then one of our newest pro projects is called uh, Weave Flagger, which provides automated progressive delivery um, using service meshes and sometimes without service meshes. Uh, and we've got many more that actually will be featured in this weekly series, so uh, check it out. Uh, and we also do have products. Uh, so some of the things, uh, the projects that I mentioned earlier, especially Prometheus slash Cortex, Scope and Flux, um, our first product that we put out there is called Weave Cloud. It's a SaaS product that um, provides all of these as a service so that you have um, a great um, monitoring and automated deployment and observability solution um, to do Kubernetes management. Uh, so we run, we have been running Weave Cloud um, on Kubernetes on AWS. Uh, so we now have um, four years of experience of running Kubernetes in production. And so as part of that, uh, we have now, we are in the process of, process of productizing um, that layer that we created um, to deliver this project uh, product. And um, as part of that, we provide some consulting and training and support uh, for people who often go on that journey to um, um, kind of distribute, uh, to um, set up Kubernetes, um, but need help doing that. Uh, so if you have any questions on any of these, feel free to reach out to us. So our website is weave.works if you haven't uh, seen that yet. So check it out and let us know if you have any questions. So thanks for listening. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping. As I mentioned, we're very lucky to have Brice Fernandez from our customer success team here. Uh, my name is Tomo, I'm head of developer experience. Uh, these sessions um, usually go about 45 minutes, but they can be as short as 30. And if there are tons of questions, then we will go a little bit over, but have a hard, hard stop at 60. But generally these sessions are about 30 to 45 minutes. Um, we are using a platform called Zoom. Uh, hopefully you're familiar with it. Um, if not, uh, the main thing to know about Zoom is that uh, when you ask your questions, the best way is to do it through the chat box. Uh, if you don't see the chat button readily available on the top left corner of your screen, um, sometimes hitting escape will get you out of full screen mode, which we'll 
help you find the functionality there. Uh, another thing is when you do chat, please make sure that uh, in the to line, you choose to everyone, or in some cases, it's to all panels and attendees. Uh, so that way, uh, everyone can see your questions and sometimes people answer each other's questions so uh, they can see your answers. Uh, unless you have something burningly private that you want to just send to me, then please make sure to choose everyone in all panels. So with that, I will hand it over to Brees. Brees, let me know if you need me to stop sharing or if you can just take over. Uh, and I think you're muted. Yeah, I think I can just take over actually. Uh, that should be okay. Excellent. Uh, thank you for the introduction, uh, Tamo. Um, I'm going to be talking today about uh, delivering quality at speed with GitOps, which is a, a fairly fancy title for essentially um, an introduction to GitOps and some practical applications of it that we've put in place at Weaveworks and we've seen in our customers. But really, I'm going to be focusing on things that are kind of fairly tactical, fairly technical process and tools, um, and really kind of the principles of operations, how to operate we've worked, uh, how to operate GitOps uh, to deliver a platform uh, for your software, how to use GitOps to speed up your delivery of software. So firstly, kind of what is GitOps? Well, in the traditional model, um, we, you know, it's, we, we want an operation model for operating on our platform. So this is how to actually act on our systems. And those are software systems running your code. Uh, it's derived from computer science and operations knowledge. So the four years we've, we've spent with Kubernetes, building Q, uh, production grade Kubernetes cluster, maintaining it, operating it, all of that, in, all of that expertise has kind of been encoded in GitOps. We have um, really kind of, we've called it GitOps, but it's a fairly technology agnostic idea. It's a bunch of principles. Uh, it's kind of why instead of how, so it's kind of why you do things. Um, although obviously kind of people like us, uh, we've, we've works, the company can help you a lot with kind of how to do GitOps. And, and the core value here, the, the, the thing that really makes a big difference is the speed increment you're going to get. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about the speed increment later, but really that's what it's about. It's about getting software into production faster so you can kind of innovate and um, kind of deliver value faster to your customers. So let's talk about the GitOps model a little bit. So traditionally, this was what was used before. You'd, you'd have a direct access into your Kubernetes cluster. Now this could be this could be outside of Kubernetes as well. This could be any system. You know, you have direct access to your system, and traditionally you'd have you know an engineer who would be able to directly connect and operate on the system. You'd log in, you'd make a change, you'd log back out. What we're doing here with GitOps is we are not allowing direct access. Right, we're disabling direct access for most common operations. In fact, direct access should be an escape hatch in case something goes really wrong. It should not be the standard way of operating your system. Instead, what we do is we have an engineer make commits to a repository. We have a configuration repository that describes our entire system. And that's where the engineer is going to be making changes. That, that's where you operate on your system. Instead of operating on the system directly, you're operating on the configuration, on the declared configuration. And then you have some sort of deployment agent that's going to bring that configuration and make sure that the system matches the configuration you've defined. Now, interestingly, usually what we do is we put the deployment agent inside the security boundary, uh, and I'll go into kind of more details about this later, but the idea here is that we, we are leaving the credentials inside the secure zone instead of putting them outside the secure zone. So typically in a existing CI pipelines, the credentials to modify your system are outside of your security zone. Instead here, what we're doing is we're putting the credentials inside the security zone kind of in a, in a well-managed way. So now we have changes going from like the configuration into your system. Uh, the next element of GitOps is that the state, we have an image repository as well that's defining state. This is, these are your artifacts. Uh, so you have a bunch of immutable artifacts. These artifacts end up in an image or uh, an artifact repository. And then the GitOps agent then looks at both not only the configuration, but also the artifacts, and then brings the artifact into your cluster. But that's not sufficient. That isn't sufficient to actually get GitOps working for you. The operation model is more than just this. What we're doing as well as part of our operation model is we are continuously monitoring that the state in the system in Kubernetes matches the expected state we have in our configuration repository. So, so really here we have a control loop. 
and, and this is the core of it, right? This is really where, where the magic happens, where you gain the speed improvements. It's by having a control loop that's continuously monitoring the system and the configuration and continuously bringing the system back in line with the configuration. So it has a lot of benefits. Um, so, so let's talk about some of the principles here that, that we've actually embodied in that kind of process. So the first one is that the entire system is described declaratively. Right? Every piece of the system is a declaration as a piece of data uh, in a configuration repository. The second one is we have this state of version, right? That's really important. You want to know who made a change, when they made the change, and why they made a change. Um, traditionally, if you have direct access to your system, that's really hard to get, right? If you give, in the Kubernetes world, if you get direct access to your engineers through the kubectl command line, it's almost impossible to capture the who, why, and what, and, and what they did. Um, it's really, really hard. The best you can really do is a bunch of logs, which is not a, a very useful format for doing actual kind of everyday maintenance tasks and operations tasks. So we want a version state, and that's usually in Git. And then what, once we have this version state, you don't want to have to do things manually. Once you have that version state in version control, um, every approved changes you make to the state should be automatically applied to the system. Uh, so this is, I guess you could con consider that as continuous delivery, right? You're continuously moving those, those changes. And as soon as you make a, a change to a declaration, I say, I declare that my system will have three machines. Uh, and then, you know, later you say, I declare my system will have four machines. Well, that should automatically be applied to your system. You, your system should be a mirror of your configuration. And what happens in real system is things break, right? Things diverge. So it's not sufficient to just bring, an, bring the approved changes into your system. You need to continuously monitor. And so this continuous monitoring to make sure that your system matches your expectations is where the software agent is there to ensure the correctness. You're ensuring correctness. And as soon as you diverge, you either A, take a corrective action, or B, uh, alert a user. So alert on divergence. So that's the fourth principle. So if we go through our kind of flow again, we can see that the entire system is described declaratively. Well, yeah, that's all in Git. So we have a Git repository with a declared uh, system configuration. And in, in our case here, we're, we're operating Kubernetes. So that's likely to be something like uh, Helm charts or Kubernetes manifest YAML files. But this would apply exactly in the same way if you were using Terraform files instead. Right? You'd have Terraform files in a repository. The second one is the desired system state is versioned. That lets you do really easy kind of trivial rollback. You can go backwards in time very easily. Um, you can also know exactly what happened and why. So you have a fantastic audit trail of changes to your system. And third, you have approved changes to the desired state that are automatically applied to the system. That's where your GitOps agent, uh, in this case, this is Kubernetes, so you'd be using the Flux agent, which is one of our open source agents that Tamo mentioned earlier. You'd be using Flux to drive those changes straight into your system as soon as you make a change in Git. And finally, you want continuous monitoring, right? If you don't have the control loop, you're not doing GitOps. The control loop is the core of kind of GitOps. It's not just bringing changes to your system. Uh, we've, we've had that for a while with infrastructure as code. It's a control loop that makes the biggest difference here. That's continuously monitoring your system automatically and will take a remedial action on divergence. And if the remedial action fails, then it will alert a human, right? So you have this control loop that's continuously ensuring your system matches what you're asking it to do. So what, what should be GitOps? What should be brought under this approach? And, and I am sorry for GitOps. I don't think that's a sin against the English language, but I ho hope you get what I mean. So what should be brought under this approach? Well, let, let's start with the standard things, right? the things that are obvious. Things like Kubernetes manifests, right? If you have a manifest for a Kubernetes deployment or a Kubernetes object, this could be a custom object, it doesn't matter, but as soon as you have a, a kind of a YAML file that declares a, an object in Kubernetes, well, you should put that in Git and that should be deployed automatically through GitOps. Application configuration, well, application configuration is either going to be a config map or part of your deployment object, so that should be in GitOps as well. Provisioning scripts, by that I mean kind of your machine and your infrastructure scripts, well, that should be Terraform, that should be declarative, that should be in Git as well. And ideally, that would be in the same repository so you kind of understand the life of your system throughout. 
So the configuration and the manifest and your infrastructure that supports it is in a single repository. So you have a really good picture and understanding of your entire system. So those are kind of standard stuff, right? Stuff that you'd expect to be in Git. But then let's move into things that might, you might not have thought to bring into this approach. So one of those is dashboards. So your dashboards really should match your, uh, your configuration and your deployment. So you can imagine that a service is going to have a configuration file that's going to be committed in Git. Well, this service, in order for the service to operate, it's going to need to have dashboards, it's going to need to have alerts, it's going to have a playbook, which is a, a documentation for your operators that tells them what to do in case of an alert. So you have dashboards, alerts, and playbook. Those ought to be in Git as well. Ideally, you put them in the same repository so that when you create a branch to create a new service, all of those changes, the, let's say you add a new machine, you add a new service, you add a new deployment, and you add a set of alerts, a dashboard, and a playbook, all of those changes are related logically, right? They're semantically related. You're doing the same thing. You're deploying a service into your infrastructure, into your, into your production environment, for example. Well, all of those changes you want to put together, you're putting them together in a branch, you're merging them together, and then they get automatically applied. So that's the beauty of it. All those log logically um, connected changes are going to be put together so that you really understand what happened and why in your audit trail of the Git log. But you can keep going, right? You can keep going with other things into that approach. So for example, application checklists are one of the things we internally put in, in our Git repository. Those are constraints on applications. So for example, we declare that every application should match a set of rules. Those kind of are business rules. For us, that means every application should have dashboards, every application should have alerts, every application should have a playbook, every application should have an owner, every et cetera, right? So we have a set of business rules and we are declaring those business rules and then we are enforcing those business rules on our applications during our CI process. So that when we're creating a new application, it has to match that checklist. Every item on the checklist has to exist and that is checked automatically. So that's one of the things we put in, in uh, Git as well. As part of deploying a new service, we have that checklist of things that the service should do, all the business rules it should comply with. Pushing that a little bit further, we have things like recording rules. These are rules of how to change data, the, the metric data, as it flows through our system, where to route the metrics data, etc. So how do we deal with metrics? We have dashboards and alerts and playbook, but more than that, we define some of the metrics, uh, wiring and implementation and the plumbing of the metrics, and we put that in Git as well. And finally, sealed secrets. So secret management is a big thing, and really you want to have a system that allows you to do version secrets, right? You want to be able to change the version of a secret. You want that to be painless when you're cycling your secrets, and the way you want to do that is through sealed secret, which is a way of adding kind of secrets into a GitOps pipeline. So you'll notice that all of these are kind of technical application domain, right? Those are the domain we're talking about. All of the technical de definitions you're going to want in there. So everything that describes your system really ought to be GitOps. You ought to have all of that inside a Git repository declaratively defined uh, and so that you can track changes to it. So, so why, why should we care about all this, right? Why, why, why should we care? Well, one of the reasons we should care is how it helps us in terms of security. So let's think of a traditional CI CD pipeline. And we can see this is, this is our traditional pipeline, right? You've got the dev on the left hand side, you've got the system on the right, and essentially code goes through the build pipeline. The build pli pipeline talks to your system and injects the code, pushes the code into your system. The problem here is, is that you have a lot of access rights into your CI CD pipeline. Now that's a very attractive vector for malicious code and malicious user or just errors occurring, you know, naturally non-malicious uh, problems. So instead what you do, you create kind of a complete separation and you have your pipeline whose role is purely to build immutable artifacts that are well named and well versioned. And then you have a separate configuration repository that, declare, that defines your system. The actual rights, the permissions to modify your cluster are actually inside the cluster itself, right? So you have no access control issues because all of the permissions uh, to modify the cluster are inside the Kubernetes cluster or whatever system you're, you're running if you're not using Kubernetes. So the canonical desired state is in a, in a Git repository. 
So the next step is your operator, whoever's going to operate your system, is now going to modify and control this configuration repository to change the system. That's how you act upon the system. And that has a really nice property, is that it's a very well-defined interface between the humans who are going to make changes and actually the system that you want to secure. So it's really easy to implement processes and constraints, which is really important in an enterprise environment. You're going to have controls, business controls, security controls that you need to be enforced. For example, you might have a rule that every change to your production system should be reviewed by at least two people in addition to the person who proposed the change. Well, you can enforce that at that level, at the repository level. You know, you don't allow changes to the master branch to occur unless the business rules and the business controls have been, have been met. Uh, and that can get very sophisticated, right? There are tools like the open policy agent that let you define very sophisticated policies around controls that, and can be plugged in at this, at this stage. Now you've kind of a good access control, you also get exceptional auditing and attribution, right? It's very, very good. Git is very, very good at auditing. It's designed to, to allow audits. It's designed to allow attribution. That's kind of the use case for Git is, the, the, the reason it came into being is, there was a, a malicious change that made it into the Linux kernel. And nobody could answer where this change originated, who'd made it, how it was accepted. So they built Git specifically for securing a pipeline of code that was that needed to be highly secured and needed a really good attribution qualities. And so you already have that baked in when you use Git. So why should we care, right? Well, why should we care about kind of what do we get out of using a pipeline like this? Well, trivial rollbacks, right? I, I've been in a situation personally where I, I've had a, an incident on, on our production system while I was on a call with a customer in Zoom, like we are now, and I could jump into my Slack channel on the side and say, hey, we have an incident on this service, it's not working as expected. We reverted back to a known good version, and I literally, I just turned around to the customer on the call and said, hey, could you just reload the page? And they did, and the problem was fixed. That's the speed of change we're talking about. That's the speed of change we should be aiming at. Really great auditing and attribution. We talked about that already. Separation of concerns. So there are some industries where you're, you're kind of obligated to separate the operators from the developers. That's very common in the financial sector. Uh, so this allows you to do that in a very structured way that can be verified by the auditors. So when an auditor comes up to you and says, can you prove that the developers did not in fact operate the system and that the operators did not, did not develop the software, you can say, absolutely. Here's the audit trail, here's the Git commits. Here are the people who actually made changes to the software. So that's because we're not crossing, crossing security boundaries. That's, that's one, of the, one of the good things too, is we've separated uh, the concerns between kind of um, actual deployment and building artifacts uh, so that the access control, like the access to the cluster doesn't cross security boundaries. Um, there's really good process and constraint enforcement. You can do that, build that on top of Git. We've had those tools available to us for a really long time as developers, as software engineers, software developers. So the idea now is to bring those tools into the infrastructure space to really empower us to kind of build really complex workflows in a, in a good way. Um, it's also a great place for human and software to work together. So because we have this Git repository, software can make Git commits. That's pretty straightforward to, to build in software. Uh, the files we're committing are, are structured data. So it's YAML, JSON, Ter uh, HashiCorp configuration language for Terraform. So software can read those files and output those files back. So this is just structured data. So it's really easy to have software and humans both collaborate on the same repository. Uh, and it's very easy to validate for correctness, right? Unlike code, if you had a bash script, let's say, that was modifying your system, that's really hard to verify that it's doing the right thing. If you have a piece of data, so much easier to validate for correctness, right? Um, literally, you'd have to solve the whole thing problem if you want to validate your code that's making a deployment. If you're validating a piece of data, you can fully scope that and have absolute guarantees about what the data can and can't do. Uh, and finally, because we have that control loop, um, your system can self-heal, right? You can delete a node manually, and, and I'll, I'll show you an example of this, uh, and the system will self-heal. It will bring the node back. It will enforce the nodes coming back. So 
um, I think it's, it's it's important here when we talk about GitOps to talk a little bit about GitOps security because all of the security stuff relies on having a secure Git environment, right? So we want a secure Git environment. We're moving the control, the the kind of the the locus of control from the CI CD environment into our repository. So our repository, our Git host. So our Git host now needs to be pretty secure. Uh, and here is just some kind of quick tips on how to do that, how to ensure that your Git host is secure. Um, you, you want to mitigate user imp impersonation, right? You want to enforce strong identity, um, and that is with GPG signed commits. Ideally, you'd want to use physical GPG keys. Uh, you want to use GPG validation code in CI so that you can ver verify that the uh, actual code that was committed uh, is by the right person, and you want to do that in your infrastructure code as well. Um, in terms of kind of, I'll, I'll kind of go over this very quickly, but you don't want to automate signing. You want that to be a manual step because it has semantic meaning, right? It, signing means I, as a person, approve of those changes. It's what you mean. So it's, it's kind of a, a quite an important step. And you probably don't want to do that on every commit. And you technically do not need to do it on every commit uh, fundamentally because of how Git is built. You only need to do it at the top commit. So you can just sign a branch and say, I approve of this branch. Uh, instead of signing everything automatically. You want to prevent history rewrite, right? You don't want to be able to change the past. So you want your host to stop pushers to your master branch, right? You only want to move forward. And you want to back up your Git repository. Pretty standard stuff, really. Uh, you want to prevent the removal of security features. Um, so configuring your Git provider with infrastructure as code is really important. Um, so I'm calling it meta GitOps, uh, and I will actually show you an example of this. We internally have our own Git repositories being controlled through GitOps, uh, for example. Uh, monitor your Git provider's log, right? Have, make sure that you get alerts if something doesn't look right in your logs, and, and verify the commits to master. So that's just a really quick aside in security. If you want to learn more about securing Git and securing GitOps, there are some great resources. So we wrote a white paper with Control Plane, who are expert in kind of container security around hardening Git for GitOps. And, and they've given many presentations around securing GitOps in production as well. So highly recommended. Both of these resources are available online. Uh, if you look at you know, hardening Git for GitOps or securing secure GitOps in production, you'll find those resources. So, uh, so let's talk about kind of GitOps in practice. What, 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 do you, what happens when you start adopting this uh, for real, when you start adopting those practices in your environment? Well, this is, a, this is a real graph of a company adopting GitOps. Uh, and there's the key thing here, what really happened is they released more, more often, much more often. So the release frequency went, high, went, went up. So they, weren't, you know, they, they started releasing a lot more into production, which is great, because that means your velocity goes, you know, is up. So you, may, you add value to your customer faster. But in addition to that, their uptime also went up. That means they, their system was up more often than before they started adopting this. Now, this is, this is a big contradiction, right? This is a, a, a paradox because when you, go, when you move faster, you tend to have you know, more mistakes. But because we're managing the versions in a really controlled way, it's now really easy to roll back uh, to a known good version when something goes wrong. And we've built tools like Flagger, an open source tool like Flagger, that will make sure that you cannot deploy it a piece of software if it doesn't meet certain criteria, if it doesn't reach the metrics that you need, then the, the tool will automatically roll it back to a previously known good version. So this is kind of why you, you get an increase in velocity as well as an increase in correctness and, and reliability, which is pretty unusual. So they went, these uh, Cordoba, who, who's one of our customers, went from about two to about 150 deployments per week. So this is a massive change, right? This is two orders of magnitude more commits, more changes to production per week. Um, so, so, so why, why did they kind of, why did that change occur, right? Well, we can think about something that's called the OODA loop. If you haven't heard of the OODA loop, I highly recommend you look it up. Essentially, it means that it's, um, it's a piece of kind of a framework for thinking about how you gain velocity uh, in decision making. And it was kind of, it's, it comes from uh, jet fighters dog fighting, right? But the idea is here, are that it's not about how fast your plane is, it's about how fast you can make decisions. It's about the, the control loop for your decision making that matters. So in the cloud native world, in the, you know, the cloud space, this is, this is what it might look like if we kind of translated the UDO into uh, 
into words that kind of make sense of the cloud space. And really, they used to be uh, in a situation where they would do all of this manually. Every step would be done manually. So it would take a long time. Every step would be unreliable. Um, so not only would it take a long time, but it would be high risk. So they couldn't make decisions very quickly. So release cycles were slow, right? So they moved to continuous deployment. Um, they automated with software agents once the declaration is made by a human. And they created things like default dashboards so that they can automatically see what the system is doing, right? So this is, this is what really matters, right? The feedback loop is what really matters, how fast you go around that loop. And by automating it, by automating it through GitOps, you're going around this loop much faster uh, and you're releasing more frequently. So you can go kind of beyond tech uh, for GitOps. We can move, start thinking about moving GitOps outside of just the tech bubble and systems design. So there are some questions you might ask about how do you manage your enterprise system outside of just purely technical systems? So things like team membership. How do you control team membership? The org chart, the operations manual, business intelligence dashboard, business intelligence report, security policies, etc. So there's a whole world of things that we already encode that are already running systems that we have to take care of. Uh, but we, we might want to bring those under GitOps. We can manage them faster, make faster decisions at the business level, which adds a lot of value. So it's kind of moving from hard technical problem into the domain of kind of hard human problems. So, you know, what if you could roll back your sales process, right? If, if your sales process was defined in, in GitOps and Git declared, what if you could roll back to a previous version? What if you could A-B test it? What if you could create, you know, let people create pull requests on your policies or get it reviewed and approved in an afternoon the way you do code? Code reviews, you know, that goes quite quickly. What if you could do the same with your processes? You know, this is some of the ideas of kind of moving GitOps just outside of the technical bubble and trying to apply those principles elsewhere. Okay, so we've talked about the theory, we've talked about um, kind of the effect. I think it's time to kind of think, to look at that in a more concrete terms, you know, how we do GitOps at WeWorks ourselves. So we, we do GitOps in a whole bunch of different ways, and I don't want you to worry too much about that list of things on the, on the left-hand side. We're really gonna highlight key bits of how we use GitOps to uh, kind of define our systems. So the first one is Kubernetes. Uh, so for Kubernetes, I'm going to give you a short demo of how we think about managing Kubernetes. And this is a demo of our Kubernetes enterprise platform that uses GitOps, that we are in the process of open sourcing the, the kind of the core control loop to do this. So uh, I have, uh, let me jump into my, my demo environment. I have a set of virtual machines or machines. Uh, it's a bit too, too big. So I have a set of three machines. So on these three machines, I want to start running um, Kubernetes on my machines. So how do I traditionally do this? Well, traditionally, I would have used an imper imperative tool that says, please install Kubernetes on these three machines. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a repository using GitOps, um, and that's going to declare my, my, my uh, Kubernetes deployment. So this is the repository in question, and we can see here that we have a machine.yaml file. So that's uh, declaring a, a set of machines. And if I go back up, we also have a cluster YAML file that declares a particular cluster, all the configuration attrib attributes of that cluster. For example, the Docker version, uh, the subnets that are going to be used for the services and the pods, et cetera. So we, we have all of this in a set of configuration files. And I go back to my uh, system, and now I can use a tool. And instead of plugging my tool directly into a file, I can point my tool at a Git repository. So let me find it. So I'm using this tool, WKS control. I'm pointing it at my Git repository. I'm giving some keys and some details. <coughs> and when I do that, what's going to happen is I'm going to bring my cluster 
in line with uh, the what's in the Git repository. So this is creating a cluster. I'm installing a new cluster here from scratch on a bunch of, of virtual machines. Shouldn't take too long. So this is kind of the initialization. And you'd only really do this once for your cluster. And then to manage the cluster, we're not going to be directly connected to the cluster. We're going to manage the cluster through using our uh, Git repository and making changes to our Git repository. So we'll wait until this is done. And that should be a Kubernetes installation. We can verify this. Um, We're generating a cube config file to access the cluster. Uh, and if I put a watch on this, we could, should, should be able to see the cluster slowly coming up. So we're creating a master node, and then we're adding two nodes. And the third node should be coming online very soon. So the idea here is that we've created a cluster based on some configuration. We, we've not kind of uh, created it manually. We've declared a cluster, and then tool implements that automatically. And while it's installed, it will also install the agent that controls the cluster. So there's going to be an agent on here. So now it's all kind of installed and ready. I should be able to ask my cluster. what's running on, on, uh, on the cluster. I can spell my uh, command right. And, and we can see that there are some system tool, and in the system namespace, there's Flux. Flux is the agent that's going to run that control loop. In addition, we have the WKS controller. So Flux is going to bring objects into your cluster. WKS is now going to implement those changes that we make. So this is where it gets really interesting. Uh, you can see here, when I actually get the machines, I have you know, three machines, one master, two slaves. If I want to operate on this cluster, I wouldn't delete a machine manually or rerun the tool. What I would do is instead is I would make a commit to my Git repository. I have a Git repository here that's defining a set of machines. So what can I do instead? Well, let me edit this. You know, I will edit this configuration, commit it, and we should see the change being reflected in the cluster. Uh, for this example, what I'm going to do is I'm going to delete one of the machines. Now, in a real production setting, you'd have that change being verified, being validated by a second person who would verify that you're making the right changes, etc. In this demo, I'm just making a direct commit to master. This is not kind of how you'd put it in production but it means that it's much quicker to demo. So now I can go back here, and we should see that the machine and the node will very quickly disappear. We're going to be, they're going to be re removed from the cluster very shortly. And that's because we have a control loop, right? We've made a commit to Git, and now the agent in the cluster should pick up these changes and apply them to our environments. It might take a few minutes while it uh, keeps pulling the uh, Git repository. Here we go. It's noticed that it should be deleting a node. It stopped um, one of the nodes. Remove, it's starting to drain the node. Once, once the node is drained, it'll remove it from the cluster. And once the node has been removed from the cluster, it'll remove the ma ma machine object as well. So this is kind of the idea here, right? We've created a cluster, and now we're managing the infrastructure by making commits to Git, right? The declaration in Git is reflected straight away into our environments. And this is kind of how we think about managing um, clusters and infrastructure at Weaveworks. OK, so back, back to the presentation. Right? Now we've talked about deploying Kubernetes the GitOps way. How about kind of applications on Kubernetes, right? We've done the Kubernetes layer. We've talked about the Kubernetes layer itself. Now let's talk about applications running on Kubernetes. And for application running on Kubernetes, it's very much the same idea. So we have a repository. And for this one, I'm, I'm going to jump into our kind of online tool. Uh, we have a, this is just a UI over Git, but this is, gives you an idea of 
the kind of user experiences you can build on top of Git uh, of GitOps. So here I'm making a deployment, and what we'll see is actually this is also running GitOps. This is just a UI on top of Git. Not everybody likes Git as a user interface. Git has great properties, but it doesn't have to be the user interface. And you'll notice here we're making a commit, just like we would manually. Just like I showed you making a commit into a repository previously, here we're making a commit, but it's a tool making a commit on our behalf because we want a better user interface. And we can inspect the commit that's actually being made here. Right? It's just a commit. The, the tool doing the work um, or I doing the work is identical. The commit itself is not going to change. It's exactly the same commit. So this is what I mean about you humans and software collaborating on the same, in the same place, right? This is a piece of software doing the work and, and making the commit, or a human could make to do the work and make the commit. So they're collaborating together uh, to operate your system. So that's kind of a GitOps deployment for an application. Here we've changed the application version instead of changing a node, one of the kind of higher infrastructure level objects. We're changing an application level objects. We could also change application configuration. Let's say I wanted to change the CPU limits or the memory limits. Well, I could change that in the Git repository commit and that would be applied on the cluster automatically. Same with the uh, various um, configuration options. So the environments, variables, uh, mounted configuration files, etc. all of that would work exactly the same way. I would change the configuration files, make a commit, have my commit verified in a branch, merge that into my master branch, and then that would automatically be applied to my cluster. Okay, so now we're talking about deploying a service. But there are more things we do with GitOps in production at Weaveworks. One of them is we use automated diff tools that automatically alert when something doesn't look like the configuration. Uh, for example, uh, we have alerts defined in Git. Let me... Uh, give me a few seconds, my... Uh, we've got some lag on the screen here. So the idea here is that we've defined an alert in Git uh, this alert tells us when our configuration repository doesn't match the reality. But this is a pretty special alert here because this is actually looking at our configuration of GitHub itself. For example, this is an entry in our GitHub configuration. This is my entry. I'm a member of our team Git, uh, of, at Weaveworks on GitHub, and we are managing this through Terraform, through GitOps. And the idea here is that I'm add, you, know, you add a member to the team, not by clicking the button in GitHub, but by adding it to your configuration file and then making commit. That means it has to be reviewed. That means there's a tracking, there's kind of an audit log of when and who made a change to the organization. And in fact, because of those things, because we've implemented that process, I've, my role is no longer an admin. I'm just a member because we no longer need a lot of people to have permissions if everybody can propose changes, but only a few people can actually approve changes. It makes it much easier to operate um, securely so that you don't kind of have credentials and access for everybody. One thing we do internally as well is have dashboards definition in Git. So all of our dashboards that we use in production are defined in Git. Uh, we use a tool called Grafanalib, which is just a, a Python tool to declaratively define dashboards. This is what Grafana Lib looks like. If you squint, it's basically JSON. Um, but what is interesting here is because it's data, it's very easy to template. So this line that I'm highlighting now is actually turns into an entire graph, right? We've created a data template for a graph based on our standard operating practice. And so that line turns into that graph. And you can keep pushing that templating idea. That line, for example, turns into our standard way of operating, uh, of uh, observing a system. I see Tamo's coming online. Am I taking up too much time? I just wanted to give you a time check because we're at 10.45, well, Pacific time, but at the 45 minute mark. So okay. just wanted to check in because we do yeah. have questions that have been coming in throughout the presentation. How much more do you have? I don't want to... Uh, maybe a couple of minutes. Okay, sure. Almost there. Um, yeah, so I, I think... 
kind of to conclude all of those kind of things we do for um, to, to use GitOps in our production system leads to quite a lot of interesting properties. Like we can recover our entire system in about 30 minutes. That's the entire system. If we deleted the AWS root account on which our entire production system relies, we could get it back up and running in about half an hour. Uh, we make dozens of small uh, of changes per day. This is a very high frequency of changes in our production systems. We've got really fast regression response. I've already talked about my experience of being on a call and changing it back. We've got a really permissive approach to access to our production system. Everybody can propose a change, but only a few people get to approve it. And we've got a really good developer experience as a result. Uh, and I would say stress-free on call uh, because you have the ability to revert or, or at least stress-reduced. Yeah, that's, that's it. That was it. <laughs> um, so maybe we can take a look at those questions now. Uh, yes. So, you know, uh, apologies in advance because some of these questions came in pretty early, but um, I guess the most recent one, we'll start with the recent one, which is at some point you were sort of talking, um, I'll just go into the question. Um, they're wondering if some aspect um, replaces Kubernetes YAML files. Um, sorry. So, yeah, so I think it doesn't, um, it doesn't replace the Kubernetes YAML files. What it actually does is it uses the Kubernetes YAML files in a Git repository. We're just, it's just a, a way of operating with those YAML files. So we're using them, we're putting them in, in a Git repository so that changes are tracked over time uh, as you would normally. And then in addition, we have that control loop that's continuously pushing them into our, into our system. Okay. Um, and yeah, just so reminding anybody, if you have questions, please post them in the chat box and um, please ch um, post them to everyone or all panelists or attendees. Um, so a lot of these are uh, coming from um, a person who originally BC came in kind of trying to see how it compares to Terraform. Uh, so as part of that, so the additional questions were, um, how does the system state, sorry, how does the system state stored? Is the config um, defined in Git, but then is the state in Git as well? Uh, and then I guess, yeah, bigger picture, like how would you compare this to Terraform? Yeah, it's a really good question. So uh, in an ideal situation, ideal world, you would have no, no difference between your declaration, your configuration, and the entire state of your system. In practice, that's not possible. So for Terraform, uh, we have, for example, we store our state in S3, but we store our Terraform files in, in kind of a repository, um, as you should, right? That's, that's the idea behind Terraform. Um, for things like Kubernetes, the, there are some kind of uh, so, some things that can, that we do not store in Git, especially when you do things like persistent volume and persistent volume claims. Those are tend to be stored. They're going to be in etcd, so you still need to back up etcd for those reasons. But we're trying to go towards a world where that's not needed, where everything is in the Git configuration repository. Excellent. Okay, we got a bunch of questions. We got to get through here. Um, how do you make a declarative change with things like canary deployments? You need to declare the image you want to deploy uh, slash do the canary deployment, but the final state of the system can't be known in advance. Question. Yeah, that's a really, really good point. So canary deployments uh, took us a while to figure out how to do that declaratively. So, so we have a tool that will do that. So Flagger and Flagger, you, you'll declare several things. So firstly, you'll declare how to make a canary change um, in, you will declare how to do that. Then the tool itself will change. It, instead, of, instead of making the commits yourself manually, it's the tool that's now making the commits. So you're still keeping track of the changes, but it's now the tool that's doing those changes manually for you instead. Um, cool. And I, I just shared a, a link to the, our flag or apps if anybody's interested. Yeah. Um, so do you have a solution for managing Kubernetes secrets and persistent volumes? So Kubernetes secrets is handled quite well by something called sealed secrets. Um, it's, it's an old product project now um, in, in that it's several years old and it hasn't had a lot of active development, but that's not because it's not use, used anymore. It's actually because it's mature and it does everything it needs to. Uh, so sealed secrets uh, tends to work quite well for managing Kubernetes secrets. Uh, what you're doing is here is you're having an operator on the cluster with a master master key, and then you're encrypting secrets by asking for the public key from the cluster, encrypting the secret, and putting the publicly the public key encrypted secret in your configuration files, 
and you version that just like you would any other variable. Uh, and that tends to work quite well in practice and it works well with Helm charts, et cetera. So we, we've seen that work, uh, work well in practice. Okay, cool. And if I want to implement this on-prem, what are the requirements? So uh, this works really well on-prem. Uh, the tool I showed you earlier about that's uh, deploying a cluster, Kubernetes cluster, is actually designed to work in an air-gapped environment. So that's not just on-prem, that is on-prem without internet access. Um, so all of this, the control loop, instead of pointing it at some, say, GitHub as a, as a provider, you can just point it at an internal host. Right, so you can have an on-prem host for your Git repositories, point your, your, control, your control agent to your internal host, and then everything is on-prem. There's no external dependency. Same with your, um, same with your image repository, right? image, re image registries. All your artifacts, if you want to have a, a, an on-prem artifact repository, then everything works exactly as expected. Um, there's there's no, no changes to be made uh, to, to work on-prem. Excellent. Uh, if anybody has last questions, please put it in the chat. In the meantime, I will uh, share my closing slides. Hopefully you can see them. Did that work? Yep. Okay, excellent. Uh, so uh, as a reminder, like I said, this is our um, weekly series, mostly on Tuesdays. Sometimes we have a special um, event on a different day of the week if we have like a particular announcement or something. But um, so for example, August 28th, we have a special edition um, Weave user group event uh, because as I mentioned, our project Flux just got accepted into the CNCF as a sandbox project. So we'll be sort of presenting on that. Um, but otherwise, we're mostly here on Tuesdays. Um, if Tuesdays don't work for you, feel free to email me. Um, we're happy to work with different times and such but this has sort of been the time that most people have come but you can see we've got a full calendar that um, if you haven't seen uh, Stacy is another member here she's one of our community managers uh, she's been diligently grading great speakers and content here on the calendar um, also we'll be following up with an email um, on ways to connect with us um, we have a Obviously, we have an ebook that you can download on GitOps so if you want to learn more. Uh, we're always on Slack if you want to chat with us, have further, further questions. If this is the first time that you've joined us here, the best way for you to know this calendar that I mentioned is to join our meetup group. Uh, that's where the that's pretty much the single source of truth on uh, what's to come. Uh, so with that, let me just double check again. Oh, this is the curious thing about Zoom. Um, any last questions? Nope. Well, thank you again. Thanks for everybody for staying for the full length, <laughs> the full extra length. And, uh, and I said some highs there. It's good to see some familiar faces and some new people too. So thanks again to Brees. Thanks everybody for joining. And I look forward to seeing everybody at future events. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.